Welcome back to class, everybody. It's a bloody sandy day in the neighborhood, and today is the day. The Japanese episode. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the wide array of Japanese weaponry that exists, its form, its function, and along the way, I'm going to dispel some myths, state some opinions, some facts about those, you know, the, the myths. Um, I just want to get this out of the way right now. If you don't agree, that's fine. If you think I'm wrong, that's fine. If you think I'm full of shit, that's fine. Tell me in the comments. Give me your cite your sources on your information. If I'm wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong. But if if what you're going off is hearsay or myth that you just fervently believe, feck off. <laughs> feck off. I've been I've been studying Japanese weaponry as well as European weaponry most of my life. Most of it. You know, there was a there was a small gap there where I didn't know how to read and my parents wouldn't buy me books on swords because I was like less than 5. But from the age of 5 up, I have been studying weaponry on, around the world. It's kind of a passion of mine, so here we go. Starting over here with the simplest the Tontos. Tontos were used for both ritual suicide, like if I was captured, I'd, you know, chit, chit, and then bleh, and then they would chop my head off, because that was like the honorable way to go, or I'd use it to, you know, strike my flint, to start a fire, um, in a fight, you know, I say I, I grapple up with somebody, I could pull this out, stick it into their neck, you know, kind of like what you do with any other kind of knife if you're in a battlefield scenario. Um, that didn't work. Uh, next up, we're going to go into these fans here. Now you're thinking, Jake, fans are not weapons. You know, they, they're not... How is that deadly? Um, oh, come the hell on. There we go. You're right. Typically, fans are not weapons. But they were important in Japanese warfare. Very important. These were how you told your troops what to do. Because the horse cavalry, you know, a hundred yards that way isn't going to hear me screaming at them, but they're going to see me raise a fan, you know, the, the go or the don't go, you know, that kind of thing. They'll, they'll see the fan, they'll know that that's their battalion and that's the order to go or, or like stay down or, or don't go, you know. They'll see me waving these fans around and they'll know what to do. Now, in this game, for some reason, those act like wands, allowing you to like boost your magic ability, like throw fire and shit. Um, Next, we're going on to the ninja tools. Oh, everybody's favorite, the ninja tools. Uh, right off the bat, myth I'm going to dispel. Most ninjas were not black-clad super assassins climbing up castle walls, you know, seven, eight hundred feet. Now, I'm not saying they never climbed castle walls. There, there is proof that they, in fact, climbed castle walls. They, they've got climbing gear, you know? Um... What I am saying, though, is that they, they weren't all the super sleuth assassins you think they are. Most of them dressed like farmers, carpenters, laborers of some kind, you know, stonemasons, cooks. And they, they would work their way into the castle to make the assassin. It wasn't like a, give me 200 gold and you would be dead by morning. It was like, a, oh, they want this guy dead? Give me three weeks and I can get inside the castle. Give me another week and a half. And I can give them poisoned food. It was that kind of thing. Um, so they, they had these kinds of tools, which were inspired by a farm implement, surprisingly enough. I think it was probably like a hoe or something, or, or a plow. Where these, because this blade is thick on the back, would actually allow them to block a katana. Or like parry a katana. And sometimes this little knuckle ridge would come out, oh Jesus, would come out to like here. That way I could actually catch a katana between the claws, move it out of the way, leap in with my second pair, and shred a person. Um, I, shurikens emerged, much like this guy here. Uh, or, not this guy. Much like this guy here, shurikens and this other kind of specialized gear didn't really show up until, like, mountain strongholds and ninjas started to really be a thing where, like, ninjutsu and the origins of what it is to be a ninja and, like, all their training on how to blend in, how to do all these different tasks, really kicked off. 
uh, a coon, no, not, not you, the kunai, the ninja's bread and butter, didn't actually look like this. It looked like that. Thank you, Jake. Um, kunai were meant to either plain wood, spread mortar, chisel away at stone, and because of that, they were a very thick, durable knife, which meant that they were also great for poking holes in people. So the, the loop on the end was so you could hang it from your waist or, or so you could strap it to something. It, it wasn't meant to, like, spin on your finger or, like, throw it with, you know. It was just there for, like, convenience. Next up is the Chikudo, the real-world Ninjato, because don't even get me started on the Ninjatos you're all thinking of, because those don't exist. We've been over this. We're not going to talk about it today. The Chikudo had a straight back for a very important reason. This was kind of the precursor to the Katana, and the Uchi Katana, and the Tachi as we know them. The reason for the straight back was because they didn't quite have the fire hardening process, but even after that, they preferred a straight back as an assassin sword because it's easier to stab with. Um, a lot of walls in Japan were made out of a paper-like substance, so if there's a lord in a room, you know, and he's sitting kind of close to the wall, you could sneak up and then just stab him through the wall, you know? You you didn't have to, uh, uh, you know, try and slice him with it. Because, like, with a katana, if he's wearing armor, you'd have to curve your stab. With something like this, you're just going straight in, straight out, you know, right in through the back of his neck. Um, he... yeah. Next up is the comma. Kamas, tonfas, you know, weapons like that, they were all farming tools that were later adopted into martial arts and ninjutsu uh, to better blend in. You know, if I'm a farmer, uh, if that's my role, you know, I'm a ninja, I'm pretending to be a farmer, it would not be odd if I had a bushel of rice on my back and one of these sitting in my waistband. All right? that would not appear unusual. But then as I'm like walking to the local pub, right, I still got my comma on me. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm four sockies down. I just realized I still had my comma on me. <laughs> Isn't that funny, Metsuki dude? The Metsuki, by the way, were like police. Hi, editing Jake here. I go off on a hell of a tangent here, so I'm going to try real hard to summarize what is the next half hour into just a, a minute maybe. So the Tokugawa shogunate, after uniting Japan, realized they need some kind of internal intelligence agency to kind of make sure that all the factions that they'd subjugated stayed subjugated. So they created these internal spies, kind of like the FBI, and they were the Metsuki. Now the Metsuki were also anti-corruption, making sure that the, uh, the daimyo and whatnot weren't misabusing the people under their care. But at the same time, the Metsuki were anti-spy. So they made sure that the lords weren't trying to spy on the shogunate and look for weakness. So they were an FBI-CIA rolled up into one kind of agency. So, yeah. A few moments later. But let's say I had to take him out, so that way me and my ninja buddies could move a bit more freely. I'd be like, hey, isn't that funny, Metsuki dude? And then just sunk, sink, and then just disappear into the night. Because I'm not actually drunk, I'm just pretending to be drunk. I stab him through the face with it. Anywho. Damn. <laughs> that just went right in. Uh, moving on to the wall here. We've got the... Uh, oh, there it is. The Ominoyari, which is the Long Yari. Uh, the reason it's, it's known as the Long Yari is because this blade is about twice the length it should be for a normal Yari. Um, now, J in Japan, they did not use shields, meaning that these spears were not necessarily one-handable. They had to have two hands on it to counterbalance the weight and length. But because it's a two-handed weapon, that weight and length it is a given. It's like a pike, dude, like a Sarasa pike. You want that extra length because you don't have a shield. You want to keep the opponents with the swords as far away as possible. The Naginata also had some good length to it. Uh, not nearly as much. You know, this one stands about here. But that's because this one was meant to be... Sw caught on things. This one was meant to be swung. Sweeping motions. To, to take the legs off of horses. To take the rider off the horse. To split an opponent in half. This thing was meant to be swung with leverage and force. 
Now, what the fuck was, oh, high hand. Why are you tripping out? It's just this hand, too. Like, this one's rock steady. I don't know. Um, so, anywho, uh, Naginatas were used uh, by the Onabushi. Or the, yeah, the Onabushi. Or Onibusha? I don't know, one of the two. Uh, they were the wives of samurai who would defend the castle when their husbands were away at war. So they had to be, you know, they needed every advantage they could get, and giving them reach and leverage was definitely an advantage. Next up, we're going on to the mallet of Japan, the uh, Ot, yeah, Otsuchi. Um, this thing was used to batter down castle gates as well as batter down opponents, you know, because something this thick and heavy, I mean, I'm just going to show you guys kind of the lag the game associates with it. Look at that wobble. That was to represent its weight. And this thing has a lot of it. <laughs> I tried to smack down on it, but it just folded my guy's wrist. yip There you go. Um, that kind of mallet was used to just crush opposition as well as batter down gates. Kind of like a siege weapon. Because they didn't use uh, climbing ladders. Like what we used in, in Europe. They didn't climb over the walls. They just bashed them fucking down, you know, with, with stuff like this. Uh, the Kanabo could also be used for that, but most importantly, the Kanabo was used against what little shields Japan did employ, which usually weren't used in massive warfare. They were used by specialized units, because, um, again, most of Japan did not use shields. They didn't. The Kanabo was great against the Lamellar Armor, the Samurai War, because it, it's so heavy that it would just crush right through the armor. Now, Kanabos actually have another thing about them. Um, Kanabos and Tetsubos, which are the one-handed version, were famously used by the Oni, which were demons of Japan. Um, they, they were often symbolized by wielding them, because the Oni were strong enough to wield these things easily and just smash away whoever was in their way. Uh, next, we're going on to the Nagamaki. I've actually been looking for one of these for a long time. Because it's a lot like if somebody was like, I need all handle all goddamn day. In fact, uh, it's not too much of a stretch to say that the handle's probably just as long, if not slightly longer, than the actual blade. And there's a reason for that. Leverage. If I'm gripping here and we collide, you know, it's about who can push and pull on that little bit more than the other. But if I've got all this handle, I can pull a lot harder and push a lot better on my opponent's blade, because now I've got a bigger handle. I've got more leverage here. So I can shove their sword down a lot easier. Next up is the Odachi, which is slightly bigger than the Nodachi, which... If I could even draw it... It's stuck on something. There we go. <laughs> I could not get you off the wall. This is the great sword of Japan. Its impressive length and decent handle meant that on us downward strikes, it had serious cleaving power. But it was not used in the cut and thrust of combat. It was used on the charge. They'd hit, hit until they realized they were getting bogged down, drop, pull out the wakzashi or a katana, and just ching, 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 carve their way through. So yeah, these guys were usually used on the opening charge, and that was about it. Next up, we've got a katana here, but not just any katana. This is a Musashi Miyamoto classic right here. Musashi Miyamoto is one of the greatest swordsmiths of all time. He understood crafting blades in a way that I don't think the modern world is ready for. Several of his blades were given to emperors and given to to like really important lords who were then later handed to samurai who slayed demons or, or held off entire armies by themselves. They were cherished possessions in Japan for how beautifully crafted they were. Uh, next up is the Tachi. I'm going to talk more about the katanas here in just a second. Uh, the Tachi's heavy curve on the handle, as well as heavier curve on the blade, meant that it was perfect for being used on horseback, which later Japanese soldiers loved fighting on horseback. The uh, samurai in particular 
who were more wealthy, could afford horses, almost always fought on horseback. The Sonata clan is oh so infamous, as well as the Takeda clan, oh so infamous, for being masters of, of horseback combat. Now, katanas in general, as well as the tachis and all this, these are not stabbing weapons. These are slashing weapons. Now, with katanas came a art called iaido. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, it's the art of the draw, where you'd have it here, and you'd like, ching, you know, on the draw, you'd attack and, and see if you could get that that quick strike in there. Um, that is entirely a a... Like, that is not realistic on the battlefield. A samurai would not be running at an opponent and then, like, whoo, whoo, No. No. That, and, and in the middle of a fight, he's not going to sheath his weapon just to draw it and get style points on the kill. That is not realistic in the slightest. Um, more often than not, Iaido was used. So, like, let's say I had this bad boy out, which I'll get to in a minute, and I'm fighting, and I get bogged down. There's just too many of them, right? Being able to ching here, you know, and, and take an opponent out, and then sheath again and go back to fighting with my main weapon, which is this guy, would be very vital. Being able to, like, oh, shit, ching, and, you know, draw and, and chop somebody in half, that is, that is important. Okay, but it, it, it's not like it was like, oh, they used it in duels, and it was always used in the battlefield. The Ida was like the masterful draw of the... No. Most samurais, when they went to battle, if they were a sword samurai, like if they didn't have a spear, if, if the sword was their primary weapon, it was already drawn long before they ever got close to the enemy. Uh, no, wait, you go back on. You know what? I'm going to talk about you real quick. This is a cross spear. These things were used more often than not to catch horses' legs if you miss the thrust, or to hook a rider and pull them down off their horse. It also meant that if I am on horseback and I'm galloping by and my thrust miss, that wing is still going to slice and catch. And if I hit somebody square with that thrust, there's a good chance that it'll cut through their body and free itself then get stuck in them and take me off my horse. Now, if I'm using this as a foot soldier, that's a lot of reach that I can jab, and because the head's now wider, I don't have to be as accurate. As long as one of those side blades catches them, I've still got them. So, that's really nice. Uh, nothing on the other shoulder. Wagzashi and katanas on my hip. Again, slicing slashing weapons, not stabbing weapons. Um. If I had to pick between a katana or a wakzashi, I'd probably go wakzashi, just because it, it fills a very niche role in weapons of being a short sword that that doesn't, you know, take up a lot of space. A lot of short swords in Europe are very wide, thick weaponry. Um, just a, an off-the-cuff example here. Uh, the Gladius. Nope. Oh, now you do it. The Gladius is easily twice as thick because it's, you know, a, a double-bladed weapon. But, I mean, look at the handle width as well. Plus, I can only fit one hand on the Gladius. I could fit two hands on this guy. So that way I could really drive it in, you know. I could push through or get a good chop or a good thrust. This guy, I can't do that. Plus, this guy's heavier than this guy by far. So... Yeah, I prefer the Wakzashis over some of those short swords. Um, now, that being said, I'm just going to get this out of the way. I do not hate Japanese weaponry. I don't. I have a great appreciation for its form and its function. That being said, I don't really like it. Because it's given some kind of mythological status amongst like the weebs of the world and anytime you try to correct them they get so pissed um but if i wanted a slicing sword only a slicing sword i could easily find one in there that's probably better 
for the an equal weight. Um, it, it, a sword that doesn't require two hands to to slice effectively. <laughs> if I wanted something like that, I'd much rather just go with a halberd, or or even a glaive. I mean, you all remember last episode the glaive just going thunk into that table. Uh, here we go. Uh, no, I'm I'm gonna put it. Ooh. I'm I'm gonna play that clip right now. That thing bites right into my table. Right? <laughs> Isn't that nasty? I doubt the Naginata going to be able to do that. If I want a, such a long spear, I'm just going to go with a pike. You know, I'm not going to use something like this. So there's always another weapon. You could use a maul. You could use a studded bat or a gotstag. The, the, not gokstad. What is it? Uh, the goated? It's it's a spiked, the golden dag. Okay, I was very close. You could use one of these, because it has the same nubblies. Oh, okay, it has better nubblies. It has spiky nubblies, and a massive spike on top. Oh, eh. You know, that that's going to hurt way more than the Kanabo will, because this is going to cause death. Beh. <laughs> it's just hanging there. All right. So, yeah, there's there's always another weapon. There is always, always, always another weapon. That being said, Japanese weaponry is beautiful. It's, it's, there's obvious, like, great care taken in the artistry of the weapon. There's great care put into its form and its function. Um, now, another myth I'm going to get into real quick. The folding of the steel. The reason they folded the steel wasn't to make the weapon sharper. It doesn't matter how many times you fold it, that's not going to make your weapon sharper. They folded steel for the same reason you stir your hot cocoa. Okay? It's because Japanese iron was so high in carbon, and yet other bits of it were so low in carbon. Like, their metal was shit, <laughs> to put it plainly. And so they had to mix that carbon and those impurities around and, and work them out of the steel. And they did that through folding it because they didn't have the same kiln and crucible technology that we had in Europe. They, they, they didn't have that. So they would just mix and mix and mix and mix and, until they felt the steel was just right. And then they'd, They'd cool it using different kinds of sand and, and other packing that they'd put around the blade, and that, that caused it to absorb some of that, that, you know, that's how they put the carbon into the iron, you know, was with that. And when the sword cooled, because the back is thicker than the blade, it would pull, and that's what gave it its distinctive curve, was that hardening process. When the, when the steel cooled and was tempered or quenched, it, it would pull that that thick bit and it created this a, a katana with a with a nice curve to the blade that sliced really well for what they had so now that i've covered that uh we're gonna get to the fun part i'm gonna use a few of these weapons because it'd be unfair not to um i don't have any samurais to fight I'd, I'd love to find some on the Nexus, but I couldn't. Um, bam! One and done! Again, like, like the Mycenaean Spear, like the Dory, goes right in. But at the same time, better than those two, it has this hook to it. Eh. Eh. That can, that can cut as well. It's hard to kind of stab somebody who's lying down with it. I'm trying to get you just the edge. There we go. Yep. See that? That hit and sliced out. So yeah, it, it's possible to catch with that that hook, but it's difficult. As you can see, it's it's quite difficult, especially with my tracking. Um, moving on. Boop. Ta-da! Ta-da! So when dual wielding the katana and the wakzashi, the the wakzashi was typically the blocking weapon 
because it was thicker than the katana. It was your companion sword. <laughs> oh, she's stuck on me. Hold on. A few moments later. Sit up. Sit up. There we go. Okay, so. Motherfucker. I'm, I'm trying to show you how samurais would, like, kind of take their own life. Because it, it was better to have death than dishonor. Um. Don't know if I can get her to stay, though. Maybe if I widen her stance a little bit. Eh. Eh. Yeah! So what they would do is they would take the Tonto I had, and they'd stab themselves in the gut and split their gut open, right? And then when their head fell forward, the when their head fell forward, the person behind them would take the katana and slice their head off. Now she can't fall forward, but she can definitely lean that way. So I'm gonna try and do this my best. Yeah! So yeah, that, that's what would happen. That was uh, seppuku, I believe, is what it was called. Um, and it's where, you know, samurais would be like, I've been defeated, I've been dishonored, but they're not going to get anything out of me. They're not going to, you know, because it, it, was, it was better for a samurai to die in battle. To be captured was dishonorable. So they'd be like, well, if you want to keep your honor, we'll let you kill yourself. And they they'd take their tonto and they chink and then chink head off. So yeah, that that's kind of how that went. So that has been the Japanese episode. Um, if you guys think that I'm wrong with anything I've I've said here today, go ahead and hit me up in the comments. If you agree with me, also comments. Um. I haven't been able to reply to everybody. Life's been in the way, but I'm definitely going to try uh, starting now to like, like kind of reply to some of my commenters. Um, I still can't believe how much that, that some of my videos have blown up. I, I've been just giddy about it. And I'm sorry I haven't been able to release any new content. Uh, my sweet baby girl Bonnie's just turned one year old. Uh, here's a good photo of her. Such a handful. Um, so she's getting better at walking, climbing, crawling, talking, and it's, it's been every bit of my life right now. So, um, I'm going to be trying to get some more content out soon. Uh, going to keep trying to, to churn out some videos, keep you guys interested. So, uh, class dismissed.